Hello friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I'm coming to you from Northwest Ohio where we had a beautiful week and I want to share with you all of the wonderful projects that we accomplished in the kitchen and around the homestead. So in this video, we are going to go through our process for making homemade beef jerky. I'm also going to show you how we canned up some fruit scrap jelly and it's a low sugar recipe. And then we are also going to make some chili and cornbread and do some general homestead and garden updates. So if that interests you, why don't you stick around? All right, so the first thing we did this week is make some homemade beef jerky. This was a request. My two um, teenage boys wanted some beef jerky. And so I said, why don't I show you how to make it yourself? So in the future, you can make it whenever you want. So what we did is grabbed a couple different condiments. We had Tabasco sauce. This is coconut aminos. Most beef jerky has soy sauce in it and I can't have soy. So I asked them to make some with coconut aminos. We have liquid smoke, Worcestershire sauce. I probably said that wrong. <laughs> soy sauce. We have some honey and some salt. And then I also took some of our frozen garlic puree cubes that I made several videos ago uh, for you. And we went ahead and thawed those out so that they can make some garlic jerky if they would like to as well. So typically when we make jerky, we would use a round steak or a round roast, something like that. Um, we are using sirloin and flank steaks because that is what we have left in the freezer from our homegrown beef. I'm having the kids slice it and they are experimenting with slicing it various thicknesses to see what they like. Gabriel wanted a little bit of a thicker slice and David wanted something thinner. And then I worked with Levi here on the sirloin steak. And in the end, they ended up liking it a thicker texture. So um, that's what this was about, was just experimenting with them to figure out what they liked in their recipes. And so we're going to make a whole bunch of different flavors so that they can try to find a recipe that is perfect for them. So I just grabbed some gallon freezer bags and let the boys experiment with adding different flavors. I made them, for the most part, try to measure it out or eyeball the amounts that they put in so that they could write it down on the bag. And then in the future, when we go to taste these, they will know exactly how much of each ingredient that they put in so that they can adjust it if it needed more salt or if they wanted it a little spicier or something like that. They needed to know exactly what went into each bag. So we were keeping records and just filling bags. They ended up making eight different types of jerky. And this was just a really fun project to do with the kids. I highly recommend trying this with your teenagers, especially if they like beef jerky. It's much cheaper to make it yourself than to purchase a quality, healthy beef jerky in the store. This is what we ended up with here. We have all of our bags. I'll kind of show you which flavors that the children chose. This one here looks like it is paprika, garlic, salt, and liquid smoke. This one here was red pepper flakes, cayenne, liquid smoke, paprika, and Tabasco. They wanted it spicy <laughs> with that one. And then this one was honey, Worcestershire, and garlic. And this one was liquid smoke, salt, and Tabasco. That one was by David. Let's see over here, this one was for me, it was just coconut aminos and salt. And then down here, salt, garlic, cayenne, liquid smoke. And then finally, our last bag was salt, liquid smoke, Worcestershire, and soy sauce. And so what we did is we took all of those bags and we put them in the fridge and let them marinate for about 24 hours. And then they pulled each bag out and put them on one tray of our dehydrator so that each separate flavor was in a tray. And then we labeled the trays so that we could remember <laughs> what was on each one. We have an Excalibur dehydrator. I love mine. I will link it in the description. The only thing I will say is that if I ever in the future bought a new dehydrator, I would get stainless steel um, trays instead of the plastic because I, I don't like heating food up on plastic. But this is what we have, so we will go ahead and use it. We have our list of what is on each tray. We set the dehydrator for 165 degrees, and we did it for about five to six hours. You want the internal temperature of your jerky to get at least to 160 degrees so that it is safe for storage. And once that was done, 
we took plates and little paper plates and labeled them and chopped up enough jerky for the entire family to taste a little bite or anybody who wanted to taste it. And we went around and we critiqued and gave advice and told the boys um, what they needed to add to each one um, to improve it or which ones were their favorite and they liked them just the way they were. And this was a really fun family activity. Um, all of this started because my older sons were watching a Western and the cowboys were eating jerky and they're like, is jerky something we can make ourselves? And I was like, absolutely, I'll show you how to do it. And then if you ever want to do it yourself, now you know what to do. And so this was just really, really fun. I highly uh, recommend this family project. So in the end, the favorite one that was voted the most delicious by everyone just contained garlic liquid smoke and salt. It was very simple and that is what the family seemed to like most. I loved as a soy free version, I loved the coconut aminos one. It was really delicious. I like a sweeter jerky. So the one with the honey and the garlic was really good. Next time we plan to experiment with maple syrup and maybe a little bit of brown sugar and things. Um, but this was our first round and we found one recipe that we really liked. So now we'll just keep improving from there. On to our next project. We are gonna make some juice. I've done this for you guys in many other videos. I have my home canned cranberry juice and home canned Concord grape juice. And maybe once a week or every other week, I let the kids have a little bit of juice with breakfast. And I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna take the scraps from this juice to make a jelly. So I am pouring two quarts of cranberry juice and two quarts of grape juice into my um, jug here, my little juice jug. And we're straining out the fruit because when I make juice, I raw pack the fruit, the berries or the grapes in the jar, just fill with water, can it that way, and then I strain out the juice when we're ready to use it. Got my little helpers stirring it all together. Of course, they're sniffing that because there's nothing like the smell of Concord grapes. It's just delicious. I did let them add a little bit of sugar this time, just about maybe a third of what was there because she grabbed way too much <laughs> to begin with. They're pouring in just a little bit of sugar and mixing that around. And this will be a wonderful treat for them to have with breakfast. So we got one use out of that fruit in our first batch of juice here, but there's still a little bit of flavor and nutrition left in those berries. So we're going to put them in a pot of water on the stove, and we're going to try to extract a little bit more juice so that we can make a batch of jelly and just make uh, a frugal jelly that is using up as much of the flavor in this fruit as possible. So we're just going to let that kind of simmer on the stove while we work on making breakfast. I'm pouring out the juice and portioning it out for the seven children that will drink it in the morning. I always get questions about my cups. I have a stainless steel set of cups and then I have these plastic ones and they have the colored bands around them and people always ask what those are for. Well, um, to cut back on dishes in my house, my children get one cup a day and then we wash it out at the end of the day. And so we keep these bands and every child has a color and it works out that they get their favorite color <laughs> or colors because some of them have multiple bands. And then that's how they can tell whose cup is whose so that they don't get mixed up throughout the day. All right, so this is what we had for breakfast. They've got their cran grape juice. We had some bacon and some eggs and a homemade gluten-free cobbler. This was my fruit cobbler recipe with um, pear pie filling and it was made with cassava flour to make it gluten-free and everybody seemed to really enjoy this meal and of course they loved their juice <laughs> so while they are eating i'm still working on making that jelly up we have it simmering on the stove and then by the time they got done eating i could clean up uh, the dishes and the, and the countertop from breakfast and move on to the next step of this project I'm gonna use the Pomona's Pectin Grape Jelly recipe to make this fruit scrap jelly. It uses calcium water. So I got my calcium water all mixed together. And if you use Pomona's Pectin, I will link that in the description. It is a low sugar pectin that you can use and it's activated by calcium. So it looks like at this point, our juice is about ready to go. 
I had uh, helpers sitting across the counter for me while I was working. They were just enjoying their morning coffee. I love having them there while I work in the kitchen. And oftentimes they will step in and volunteer to help me so that I can either film what I'm doing or hold a fussing baby. It's always nice to have helpers in the kitchen with you. So as you can see, we're straining out that fruit and then those berries will have a third life. They will go out to the chickens and the chickens will turn them into eggs. So we have eight cups of juice along with one teaspoon of lemon juice and four, I'm sorry, eight teaspoons of our liquid calcium water. And that is coming to a boil on the stove. In a separate bowl, we made two cups of sugar and eight teaspoons of pectin. Mix that together, and then once the jelly started boiling, boiling, we added the sugar and pectin mixture, brought that to a boil for another two minutes, and then we were ready to fill our jars. Now, I love Pomona's pectin because if I were using a traditional pectin that you would get in the store in the little boxes, this amount of jelly, this double batch of jelly, would have called for maybe a dozen cups of sugar or more. But because I used the Pomona's pectin, I only had to use two cups of sugar. So it's a much healthier um, result that we get. And on top of it, I find that I always get a gel when I use the Pomona's pectin versus when I would use the store-bought little boxes of the high sugar pectin. I Maybe one out of eight batches would not gel and I would end up with a fruit syrup that I had to use. So very excited about this end result. We have a cran grape scrap jelly and the children are gonna absolutely love this. So Elizabeth is working on wiping the rims. Jelly is super sticky, so you always wanna wipe the rims of your jars before you get your lids on to ensure that you get a good solid seal. As always, you guys know I can exclusively with my four jars lids. They're my favorite canning lids, and you can use my code 3rivers10 to get 10% off of your canning lids if you use the link in the description of this video. So go ahead and check that out. It is the time of year to stock up on your canning lids because canning season is just around the corner. So we're just getting our bands here on the jars and we are gonna get these in the water bath and they are going to process for 10 minutes in the water bath canner. And then when we're all done, we are gonna have nine half pints of wonderful jelly to feed my children. We actually ran out of Concord grape jelly about a month ago, and that is um, something my children are about to riot. <laughs> that is their favorite type of jelly is grape jelly. And we typically go through one half pint per meal that we use jelly. So for example, if I were making sun butter uh, and jelly sandwiches, it would take one half pint for a meal of that for all of the children. Or if I made homemade bread, with jelly um, to go with the meal, we would use one of these. So this will give us nine more meals of jelly and then I'll get some grape juice out and make them some more pure Concord grape jelly once things slow down. I just need to get the, <laughs> the garden planted before I do more big canning projects. Typically, I add a little bit of distilled white vinegar to my water bath canner, um, even my pressure canner, and that will prevent this mineral film that you see from our hard water that develops on the jars, but I forgot to do that with this batch, so it's no big deal. You can just take the jars out and wipe them down with a wet cloth that's soaked in vinegar, and that will remove that film. It doesn't hurt anything. It just doesn't make the jars look very pretty when they're sitting on the shelf when they have that um, mineral film on the outside of them. So she is labeling. We always label with the flavor and then the year so that we know um, exactly what is in there and when we need to use it. And everybody is always eager to help. So now we're just putting jars away on our canning shelves. You can see things are getting a little sparse there. This is the time of year where we're um, you know, taking a few jars off a day and maybe adding a few jars back. And the goal at this point is to use up more jars than we're adding back in things like jelly or broth or meats and things. Because by the time July hits, I need to have a lot of empty jars to keep up with the canning season. And so at this point, my goal is to use up most of the freeze-dried food that is up there on the shelf. Freeze-dried food should be stored in a Mylar bag for long-term storage. But I store it in um, jars up here on my pantry shelf 
knowing that I will use that stuff up within about nine months. And so we're at the point that these things need used because they weren't put in mylar. And so that has been a big goal in the last couple of weeks with my meal planning is coming up with meals that will use the freeze dried food on my shelves. So here is one example. Um, soups and chilies are a great way to use up freeze dried food. So here's a chili I made. I had some leftover steak here that we we're going to use as our meat in our chili. I have two quarts of tomato juice and then one quart of home canned beans. I did these in a video a few videos ago. These were black beans with bacon, so that will be great flavor for our chili. We have freeze-dried green onion powder, freeze-dried garlic scape powder, chard powder. This is some freeze-dried sliced okra. All of this was from last year's garden. This is fermented chili powder. This was from making homemade fermented chili sauce. And then this is some freeze-dried liver powder. We're going to put all of this together and it will make a delicious chili. So yeah, that fermented chili powder, when I ferment my peppers to make hot sauce, I take the pulp that I strain out of the sauce and then I freeze dry it and that makes the perfect addition to your chili. It's super spicy. It has great flavor. It's good for you with the fermented ingredients. So um, we really like to add that to our chili. It's a great amount of spice. And then any of my older children who want some additional spice will add hot sauce to um, it afterwards. If I make it too spicy, then uh, my younger children will not eat the chili. Just wanted to let you know that if you were thinking about getting a freeze dryer anytime in the near future, May is the month to do it. I have a Harvest Right freeze dryer. I will link it in the description, but they go on sale in the month of May and the sale prices are the same as their Black Friday prices in November. So that is the time to do it if you are planning to get one. So go ahead and check out the link in the description. Freeze drying has changed my food preservation system. I absolutely love it for um, small batches of vegetables and things that come out of the garden, particularly herbs. That is just a wonderful way to preserve them. So of course, to go with our chili, we need to make some cornbread. I have some whole corn from the pantry here. We are grinding it down in our grain mill here to make some cornmeal to make our cornbread. So um, it corn, when it grinds down, is usually very coarse. It's very difficult to grind it down. So I would need to run this through the mill again if I wanted to get it very finely ground. But I wanted a gritty cornbread on this particular day. So I just ran it through the mill once, and this is what the flour looked like. So in our mixing bowl, we have one and a half cups of that corn flour. And to that, we are gonna add a half a cup of regular wheat flour. This is also some fresh ground wheat that we milled recently that had been sitting in the fridge and needed to be used up. So this was a perfect opportunity to do that. And as always, there is a helper or many helpers here arguing over who gets to um, help. So they're taking turns. We're also adding about a half a cup of sugar to the bowl. And now it's John's turn to help, but um, Elizabeth is getting our baking powder on the spoon for him so that he was doing full spoonfuls and not less than we needed in the recipe. So we are going to need four teaspoons of baking powder for this cornbread. And like I said, always have eager helpers. And I love this. I love teaching my children how to cook for themselves. My goal is by the time my children leave the nest that they have a repertoire of recipes that they have been perfected over the years by helping me. And um, this is how they learn is when they're this little starting working with mom in the kitchen. So they got our dry ingredients all whisked together there. Now it's time to add our wet ingredients. We're adding two eggs. We're using duck eggs because we like to use those for baking, but you can use any kind of eggs. And then we're also adding a half a cup, or I'm sorry, that was a full cup of almond milk. And you can use any kind of milk. You can even use water if you're out of milk. Any, any kind of liquid there will work in this cornbread. Sometimes if we want to make it spicy, we'll add a little bit of um, jalapeno, cowboy candy, or something like that. Um, sometimes I add some uh, pork cracklings that we rendered down when we were making lard. But this day we're just having plain cornbread to go with our chili. So we got our cast iron pan greased with some lard, and then we're just gonna pour our batter in, and then we're gonna bake this on 425 degrees for about 20 to 25 minutes. In the meantime, I think our chili is all done here. 
I love the way the freeze-dried food rehydrates while it's cooking. It makes a lovely result. And this is what that chili looked like. And our cornbread is all done. It smells wonderful. And this will be a great addition to our lunch here. Some of my children really enjoy kind of dipping their cornbread into the chili and others prefer to eat it as a side dish. I'll, I'll let you take one guess on which of my children is the biggest ham and really enjoys being on camera. <laughs> I think you can tell who it is right here. He also enjoys giving me a chef kiss when he really enjoys a meal. So some of the children that eat the cornbread as a side dish prefer to have some maple syrup drizzled over the top. So they eat it that way. And then this is just a filling, delicious meal, helping me use up some of the freeze-dried things that are on the shelves. So that is the goal right now. Because now we are planting next this year's garden. We need to get rid of the things from last year's garden to make space for what we're going to preserve this year. This week I needed to up-pot my tomatoes. They... Um, have probably needed this a week or two ago, but this is just the first chance I had to get to it. And thankfully, Miss Hannah was uh, taking a nap on my back, and so I had a quick minute to do this. I'm just getting these little tomato plants out of their little seed starting trays and getting them into a larger uh, container because they will not be planted out for another two weeks. Here in our zone, our last frost-free date is typically Mother's Day weekend. So these need to be indoors just a little bit longer. In the meantime, I am working on hardening off all of the things that are under my grow lights. I take them outside and kind of keep them in the shade at this point, and we'll slowly start keeping them out for longer times and moving them into full sunlight to let them get acclimated to the environment outdoors. This is what the garden is currently looking like. This week, I'm hoping to get um, the beds filled with soil, the new beds that we built. But in the meantime, we have lots of things popping up in the beds, the existing garden beds. You saw some scallions and radishes. Our garlic is looking lovely. The junk woods behind the garden is really starting to come alive. It looks beautiful. I have transplanted a lot of the greens and things from my winter sown jugs, and they're really taking off in their new home. The peas have come up, the pea uh, that we have planted. I'm hoping that the mice will leave these alone <laughs> and let them grow. More garlic, and we also have our onion that we planted a couple weeks ago. It started to bounce back and look healthy. Lots of perennial herbs. I've transplanted some sage and oregano. I'm going to make this bed uh, an herb bed. We have some lemon balm here. Just lots of amazing things happening on the homestead. Bees, we've caught another bee swarm, so that is lovely. And so now we have the two hives of bees going. Very excited about honey this year. All of the beautiful apple trees around the property are in full bloom and just smell amazing. I love this time of year on the homestead. Other exciting news that happened this week, you guys know we have been undergoing a pretty extensive uh, cellar project. We needed to waterproof our cellar of our extremely old house, <laughs> and um, this is what it looks like now. They finished up, the excavators finished up this week. They're done with the work of waterproofing the cellar. Now we need to plant grass and get the yard looking um, better, and then they will have to come back later on, probably in the fall or early winter to fix the septic issue that I mentioned. If you're following me on Instagram, we have to redo our septic, but that will be later this year. For now, we can focus on getting the house back to looking a little more pleasant. Right now, it has all been dug up, there's mud everywhere, and I am ready to get this looking better. But this is what around the house looks like. They dug down six feet around the whole house and laid gravel to help improve drainage. Then all of the gutters and everything are tied into a tile and all of the water is tiled away from the house and the cellar is bone dry now, which is amazing. And as you guys know, we'll be using that cellar now and turning it into a food storage area. We're going to create a cold room in one corner of it and then the rest of the cellar is where we're going to put up shelves to store all of our other food. And I'm going to take you guys all along on that project. We'll do a whole series of how to build a root cellar for your family. But for now, that's it. 
We are just going to enjoy another week of getting the garden in and doing all of the other work that spring has around the homestead. And we will see you guys next week. In the meantime, have a wonderful one. Bye, friends.